Yeah, today was just like, I mean, still excited. All right. Welcome back. Welcome, everyone. Hopefully, everyone had a nice uh, week so far. My mom and dad are here. They are visiting from New York, Hello. so you can say hi to them. They will embarrass me at least once during class, maybe more times, but I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> she already told me to change my tie. She already bought me a tie, which I just. So. <laughs> so, anyway, so welcome, mom and dad. It's, I, I, if. They didn't come to my property class last semester. I don't think they visited last semester. They usually come once a semester, so they always try and come in a day with class, so it's, I'm glad to have them here. Okay, so by now, all of you have submitted your proposals. A couple of you asked to resubmit. All of you have done that. So this juncture, you are all on the right path with your topics. Uh, I may have sent you some follow-up questions. I may have sent you some things to think about, uh, but for the most part, you've all done what I wanted you to do, so I'm very happy about that. Um, the next deliverable is not for another three weeks or so, um, but you have to start thinking about the outline. And uh, at some point before then, I want you to come meet with me with something fairly developed. But I encourage you uh, before then to try to schedule time with me to discuss this. So the reading, and I'll get to the Madison in a few minutes, I'll talk about the other stuff first. Um, the reading for today on the introduction uh, the reason why I signed that was to get you thinking about what an article should even look like. Okay? The introduction serves a very important purpose. It sketches out the various parts of an article. And articles are generally fairly formulaic. You have the facts, relevant case law, your analysis of why something is different or something's new, and then the final part, you have your thesis, right? You have your... Um, Suggestion of the court should do this, the court shouldn't do this. The court made a mistake or the court didn't make a mistake, right? So it's not exactly a science, but those four parts are what you should be looking at. And what the introduction is, it's a summary of your entire article. Don't restate the entire thing, but you pick out the highest level points of what you want to discuss. So I encourage you to read through the uh, chapter on the introduction because that will get you thinking of, oh, wow, here are the different things I need to write. Uh, we'll do other chapters later in the semester about how to actually write it. But this will give you a sense of what's called a roadmap. Okay, what do you mean by a roadmap? In part one, I will discuss the facts of this case. In part two, I will discuss the rule of law that was laid down. In part three, I will analyze why this rule was you know, lacking. And in part four, I will suggest what the court should do instead. Right? That's your roadmap. And if you look at the introductions in the chapter I signed, they more or less follow that. There's various finesses and flares to make it more interesting, but that's basically what you have to accomplish. So as you go ahead in the next couple weeks and start thinking about your final uh, uh, outline that you want to submit to me, um, try to even in your head separate the different aspects of the case. You know, what are the actual facts of the case you want to discuss, right? You're not going to copy the entire fact section of, of the Supreme Court decision because it's like 30 pages long. So maybe pick out the most relevant facts which you want to write about. Okay, uh, What's the rule you want to write about? Well, you don't need to write about every aspect of the case, but focus on the stuff that's relevant to your topic. And it's a very difficult aspect of figuring out what you want to write about. Also, you're not limited just to the decision itself. You can look at outside sources. There are these things called law reviews, right? There are these journals where students and professors write things about cases. Um, we'll talk about this more later, but I encourage you to research on Westlaw or Lexis different law review articles written on your case. It's very likely that someone wrote an analysis that will give you an idea. It's even more likely that someone already wrote the analysis you want to do, but that's not necessarily a problem for this class. But they'll get different insights from different professors. Uh, this might come as a surprise to you, but we do things other than teach. We're also expected to write articles, which you may see not much value in, but at least now when you have to write a, a paper for a class, they'll be very valuable. Okay? And the final part of the paper, which I want you to think about, is what's your thesis? What are you trying to change? What are you trying to recommend differently should be done? And this is the most difficult topic. And a lot of you uh, said in your proposal, I don't know what my thesis is, and, and that, that's fine. Okay? Is there, is there a thesis? Are we good? Yeah. We, have a, we have a packed house today. Okay. So think about what is your prescription? What it is that you're trying to change? And this is going to be the hardest part because you've never done something like this before, right? You're not telling a court you need to affirm or reverse lower court, right? 
you're not telling a judge, summary judgment should be granted with these four factors, which is what you know, your legal writing memos are. Here, you're actually trying to criticize the decision, say what they should have done instead, or how they should do it differently. All right? So um, as you set yourself up for this research, uh, uh, try to stay organized. Um, if you like paper, uh, definitely print out the actual decision itself, highlight it, mark it up. Uh, if you're like me and you don't like paper, PDFs are fine, and you can annotate PDFs, uh, but keep yourself organized. And as you're leading up to the outline, uh, keep like a, a list of bullets in your notes somewhere saying, oh, here are the different points I want to discuss. And you'll find as you work on this list of bullets, you start to organize and say, oh, this point should come here, and here's the flow. And before you know it, you have something approaching an outline. So don't, you know, the week before this is due, sit down and say, all right, here's my outline. Right? This should be an organic process that you work on continuously between now and whatever March, I can't remember the date, March 8th or so, March 9th, I can't remember the exact date. Okay? All right. Uh, and again, email me, we'll set up a time to discuss, because uh, I don't want you to scramble. A couple of you scramble a little bit and your topics weren't done by Sunday or they were submitted but not fully developed. So this one's gonna be a lot harder. You're not writing a paragraph, you're actually mapping out your entire paper. So meet with me sooner rather than later, okay? Any questions? Okay. All right, so today we're gonna to shift to a different aspect of separation of powers. So in our last class, our last couple classes, we've been discussing the balance between Congress and the executive. Between Congress and the executive, right? What happens when the president tries to assert power and Congress says no? What happens when the president tries to assert power and the Congress says, sure, why not? <coughs> In both these situations, it's a tricky situ it's a tricky problem because either the executive's doing it anyway, even though Congress says no, or the executive is doing it with Congress's blessing. And the Supreme Court's taken different approaches to this. In some cases, they said, well, if Congress acquiesces to this practice, then you know, who are we to say that this is unconstitutional? And other situations, like Youngstown, the court said, even if Congress is, you know, kind of going along with it, not really, it's for the courts to invalidate these actions. So it's a, it's a, it's a different dynamic, though, when we shift from between Congress and the executive to federalism, which is between the states and the federal government, right? It's a very different dynamic because rather than having one body in the Congress and one body in the Senate, you now have 50 states, and each state has its own governor, has its own legislature, has its own courts, and more importantly, has its own policy interests. You have some states that were agricultural, some at the um, time of the revolution. So you had some agricultural states. You had states that were in industrial states. You had states that were into navigation and trade. You had some states that were Baptist. You had some states that were Episcopalian. You had different states with different interests toward money. You had slave states. You had free states. You have all of these states with different people and different interests. How, right? How is it possible for our Constitution to put all these people together and make it work. How is this possible? This is a lesson we learned from Federalist Number 10 by Madison. And I've read this one more times than I can count. And every time I read it, I'm like, wow, there's some really good stuff in there. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying this is probably the most important piece of American political science ever written. Uh, whether it's accurate today or not, we, we, you know, we can argue about that, but that's time. It's probably the most important document in American history that has ever been written uh, with respect to understanding our system of government. All right. So we start from a premise, right? And I'll start to go around. Uh, 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 Kelsey, my, my fellow Johnstonian, uh, where my parents visited once and only once. And they, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> they, they couldn't come back. It was, it was bad. Kelsey, what's a faction? A Not a fraction. A, 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 a faction. As in like... How does Madison design a faction? Mm -hmm. 
You have it? Yeah, it says whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole. In your own words, in your own words, what's a faction? Uh, I would say probably like a, I don't want to say like a, a group of people that all have the same view of a certain Okay. So like a group of people that share certain passions, certain interests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like a party maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So a faction is a group of people that share a certain interest, right? I'm sure if we drive around Houston, we'll find a lot of different factions. So you have I'm sure a lot of different factions, right? You have different factions based on race. People who share different interests based on their race. You have different factions based on religion. You have Jews, you have Muslims, you have Christians, right? You have different factions based on economics. You have wealthy people, you have poor people. They have very different interests. You have factions based on jobs, right? Some people are in industry, some people are in oil and gas, some people are environmentalists, some people are farmers, some people are fishermen, whatever it is, right? I'll skip George. I'll so I'll go to Lacey. Lacey, is it often the case, or let me ask like this, do factions always agree on stuff? In the same group they always agree? No, different factions. The different factions you should agree. How is it possible then to throw so many different groups together in this melting pot and have them achieve some form of governance? They each have a voice. And what happens with those voices? And more than that, what happens when you have different voices? You know, you are legislators, legislation, you have to say why you vote for who supports your beliefs. Okay. But if everyone's voting for different people, how does anything get done? Okay, and that's the wrong answer. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you said it. Okay, uh, Justice Stephen Breyer, whom I often discuss, was asked a number of years ago, you know, what's the most important feature of our Constitution? What's the most important element of our, of our system of government? And know what his answer was? Does anyone know? One word democracy. He's wrong, he's emphatically wrong. Uh, uh, in fact, if I if you were to my exam, I'd fail him, right? <laughs> The word democracy is not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution for one very good reason. We don't have a democracy. We have a Republican form of government. And that's not George Bush, you know, capital R Republican. This is little r Republican. Right? Madison in Federalist Number 10 expresses a fear of democracy. Um, Angelina, what is this fear of democracy that Madison expresses in Federalist Number 10? Too many people would have um, too much power. Why? Why does democracy lend itself to that kind of government? Isn't democracy awesome? Everyone votes for whoever they want, and you know the best of the world. Why, why does democracy give rise to that kind of threat? I think because sometimes you're dealing with um, survival of the fittest, or the, the biggest monster of them all, or you know something like that. Just who you know. Even if we're supposed to have the votes. So what happens when you have a direct democracy and whoever you vote for wins? What's the problem with that? Well, the people who didn't vote or didn't have that same view, they're going to be upset. Well, let's say everyone votes. What's the problem with the direct democracy? Why is that dangerous? What's the threat that Madison sees from a direct democracy? Gwen, want to take a stab at it? What's the threat that Madison sees from a direct democracy? Why is this so potentially dangerous? It's tough to be with people like, like fearing there's, they could, be, could get out of control. Explain more. You're, I think you're on the right track. Um, there's no safeguards in place when everyone votes for and that person wins and what what's what's mob rule mean, Gwen? What's mob rule? It's like 
there's a mob and they all want one thing and they'll take over anyone else. And once mob. there's a mob, what's there to stop them? Nothing. I mean, okay. really nothing. If there's a mob. Like, so what's interesting is that we're often taught in school, quite incorrectly, that democracy is excellent, right? We're taught that we should all have a vote, and if everyone votes, it's fine. But that by itself is not enough. Madison feared a direct democracy because you can have a tyrant take over that way. When you have a direct vote for one person to have power, right, what's to stop that person from accumulating that power? And we start from the premise we study the very first or second week of class. Madison wrote in Federalist 51, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But we are not angels. There are no wings here, I promise. So we need a government. But a government not just to check the people, but to check the government itself. And how did Madison say the government has to check itself? Ambition must be made to counteract Ambition. And this is where factions and ambition come together. Right? Madison recognizes that we can't get rid of factions because people have different views of the world. They have different views of life. They have different views of property. They have different views of money. You can't eliminate that. The only hope and the way to minimize the problem of factions is to let them check themselves. Is to place one faction against another faction and let them fight it out. And if they fight it out, hopefully neither one can become a tyrant. When you have always people fighting against each other, it's very hard to claim all the power because everyone's grabbing for this and grabbing for that. That's part of the game. But more importantly, when you have this faction, this faction fighting over policy, something will come out of it. And that will be what we might call a compromise or a consensus. And this is theoretical. We're not necessarily discussing what actually happens. I'm trying to, I'm trying to have you understand how Madison's theories um, operated. Right? That, wh that why is it impossible, Madison says, to eliminate factions? Why can't we just, you know, Try to say, let's let's try and make society and get rid of all the factions. Why is that impossible? It is impossible because um, in order to try to get rid of faction, either go to the extreme of you know prohibit everything mm -hmm. or give them everything that they want. And either extreme is bad. very good. Can you give me an example of a society where they try to eliminate factions? Can you think oh, of one? Oh. Um, Iran. Iran, right? North can you have much North Korea? Can you have dissent in North Korea? Can people disagree in North Korea? Everyone works with the dear leader, right? Kim Jong Un. They want to see the interview. Excellent movie. <laughs> As a patriotic act to go see it. Anyway, but yeah, God bless America. So, I mean, Dad, you're, you raise a fair point, right? North Korea attempts to eliminate factions. How do they do that? By uh, by centralizing, take away everyone want or need into one central education. That's right. And I don't know if you ever consider this, but propaganda, right? You have a state like North Korea. The reason why they shoot propaganda is not because they like making those cartoons of Kim Jong-un like, you know, painting rainbows in the sky or whatever, right? It's to make everyone think alike. Mm -hmm. This is what Madison addresses. The only way to eliminate faction is if everyone thinks the same thing, right? Propaganda is attempting to force everyone to think alike, okay? And what Madison writes though, is that this is a very dangerous proposition. He makes this beautiful analogy. He says, air is to fire, right? As factions is to liberty, right? If, you know, we need air to breathe, but air can create these dangerous fires that can kill people, right? Same way, we need liberty. But in order for that liberty to preserve, you need factions. You need to have people to be free enough to make up their minds and have these people be communists, and these people be socialists, these people be liberals, and those Republicans, and these you know, anarchists, and whatever else, right? You need all that. Because the ability of taking away the freedom to choose that position 
is like depriving fire by sucking out all the air. You suck out all the air, we suffocate, we die. So Eddie, since we can't eliminate the um, cause of factions, what is Madison's solution of how we deal with factions? Because they can be problematic, they can be a problem, but how do we deal with these factions? Terms of how you're dealing with it, with respect to the consequences. Is that okay. Right? okay, yeah. So flesh that out more. Uh, I think the ultimate thing is that you uh, work in work factions to your advantage. Ah. Really, uh, you acknowledge them and accept them, and for the good thing that they can be, and you work that out through the uh, electing representatives to represent the different. Factions and different groups. And different exactly. That's exactly right. Madison's no fool. I mean, when he wrote this, he was probably in his, like, God, he may have been 30 when he wrote this, maybe in like his late 20s. It's remarkable that the men in the Constitution Convention wrote this when they were their 20s and 30s. We are, we are lagging far behind. Um, but Madison had this recognition like, listen, I got an idea. Let's use these factions to our advantage, right? And geography, though, plays an interesting role. Uh, PJ, what role does our geography of the United States play in, in, in the suppression of faction? What's unique about our country, perhaps compared to, you know, cloistered Europe, where that country is like, you know, two miles long? Yeah, and what's the attribute of having such a large country that's spread over such a wide geographical stretch? Exactly, exactly. The diversity of our country was a blessing in ways we don't appreciate, right? If you look at most European countries, they're basically all in the same climate, all in fairly routine places, right? Uh, people have to think alike, they have similar views. You go to a place like Switzerland, right, which is a fairly small country, there's mountains everywhere. You have these various cantons, which are these you know regions. They're very different, right? The diversity among states, among climate, among economies about what you're producing, this created very different views of life. So in the northern states, right, it was mostly trade, navigation, uh, manufacturing when that became a thing, right? If you go to New York, there's a lot of financial stuff in Philadelphia. And then if you go to the south, and this is part of our American history, it was slavery and agriculture. But by virtue of that, you had built into our system of government different people with different thoughts. And our Constitution didn't try to fight it. It worked with it, right? It didn't try and turn that into like something to eliminate. It's like, okay, we have these people from different states who have been sovereigns for 100 years, right, as colonies. How do we build upon that, right? So what does our Constitution do to build on this, Marcus? Oh, Michael, Michael, sorry. What I was thinking is, I mean, just the federalist, the difference between the state government and the national government. Mm, that's why. So it lets the uh, regions choose some of their own ideas in the state government. And what what about the federal government? I mean, the federal government has power as well, but it's more of a concurrent power. Ah, so I think now you're 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 getting towards the second aspect of our reading, right? So you have the ninth and you have the tenth amendments. All right, let's do the Tenth Amendments for uh, for a moment, and I think I think uh, uh, Michael hit on a good point there. The framers understood that there are certain things that are best done on a local basis, and there are certain things that are best done on a national basis. By dividing up the powers, right they're able to effectively um, distinguish what's local and what's national. So uh, if you will turn for a second, and I'll if you ever actually study this section, Article 1, Section 10 on page 26. My mom read it earlier, so I won't ask you to read it again. Right? But Article 1, Section 10 on page 26. This provision of the Constitution is somewhat unique. Because virtually the entire Constitution is saying, Congress can do this, Congress can't do that, the President does this, the President does that. Article 10, I'm sorry, Section 10 
says to the states, you can't do something. There are very few limitations on the states in the original Constitution, but almost all of them, not virtually, but almost all of them appear in this section. And what are some of the things that the states are not allowed to do? They can't enter into treaties, right? They can't declare war. They can't tax foreign imports, right? They can't uh, 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 engage in various compacts with other states, right? <laughs> Zach, why do you think these are the types of things that Congress, that the Constitution says states can't do? What's, what, what describes, I, I listen only a handful, but what's describing these? How would you describe them? I would say it's to preserve this being a union of states and not like a union of nations. Mm -hmm. um, that, it's, that the states are actually sovereign and they're not actually acting on their own accord as if they were a separate nation. So exactly, right? Almost all the things I mentioned have to do with foreign policy, right? Declaring war, entering treaties, making compacts and various agreements. So what the Constitution says is states don't do stuff that affects other places, right? Within your sphere, within your borders, you can do just about anything you need. You notice there are very few limitations in here, right? Ian, what's the police power? Remember we discussed this in uh, uh, before? What's the police power? Uh, is, it the, is it the national government being able to regulate the uh, local governments? No. no. Brandon, you remember what the police powers? It's just like, the, like you make all these laws, you're going to enforce it. So they have to police power. No, 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 no. Here you go. Um, state's power to enforce uh, their own laws. And yes. The police power is the power of the states. But specifically, it's to police the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the states, right? The states have a residual, a pre-existing power to regulate self, uh, self, health, safety, welfare, and the morals of their states. Okay, you know, I'll go back to you. Where does the states get this power this police power from? Did this power exist before the Tenth Amendment was ratified? Did the, the Tenth Amendment no. grant them this power? Yeah, it, it exists. Where? So where did it, where does this power come from? It's not going to be in that book. Okay. Where do you think this power came from? This police power. It's from the Articles of Confederation. Keep going. Even before that. Brandon, what do you think? Where where did this police power come from? Where did the states obtain this residual power to protect the health, safety, welfare of their, of their citizens? Think. Where did the states get their authority? So in New York, right, Brandon, before 1776, who is responsible for protecting the health, safety, welfare of the people in New York, the colony? Who is responsible for protecting the colony? The health, safety, welfare of New Yorkers. Who, who was responsible for that and said before 1776? The king, the monarch, the sovereign, right? Brandon, what happened when the, United, when the states declared independence? and they threw off the king. What happened to that police power? Yes. And this is the point which you need to understand very implicitly. The sovereignty the states have, this residual police power, came upon declaring independence. This may be a fiction, but this is how our constitution system is built, right? The king had a power or sovereignty, the same thing, had sovereignty over, this, over the colonies. Once independence was declared, that sovereignty descended to the colonists who were now sovereigns. The governor of the state now held the police power that the king formerly had. Everyone with me so far? 
Okay, so we start from the premise, right? <coughs> that the states have this huge body of power to protect their people. Okay, but we just read here, Article 1, Section 10, the states can't do this, the states can't do that, the states can't do this, right? Chris, where does the Constitution get the authority to deprive the states of this, of this power? How can, if the states have all this power from the king, the king of England can make treaties, the king of England can make wars, right? How is it that the Constitution is telling states, now nah, you can't do that anymore? How that, how's that work? Well, I'll say either supremacy laws or at least what specific acts Article, Article 1 enabling Congress to do. Where does Article 1 get authority from? Well, that comes from the people. Ah, yes. We the people. Right? We the people establish a constitution. And in doing so, the people relinquish some of their power. The only reason why the national government has any power at all was because the people gave it up. And they didn't give up all their power. They gave up very specific attributes of power. Colin, where do we find in the Constitution the power is given to Congress? In articles? Which one? Oh, um... Which is the one which we keep talking about. Article 1, section. Six, seven. <laughs> keep going. You're close. What comes after seven? Eight. <laughs> yeah, why six for seven? Because seven, eight, nine, right? We have. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Right. Colin, what happens in Article 1, section 8? What, what's listed in those? Congress has the power to weigh, collect taxes, and borrow money. Yes. Regulate commerce. And do a lot of other things, right? Colin, where did Congress get the authority to do all these things? How can Congress have this authority to lay taxes and regulate commerce? Where did this power come from? Chris said it a second ago, but I'm asking a different way. The people. So follow me here. This is a little bit counterintuitive, right? But the states started off as sovereigns. They had all this authority, this entire body of power. Through the Constitution, they gave some of it to the national government. And those are the powers listed in Article 1, Section 8. But only the powers listed is what they have. Congress has no powers beyond those listed in the Constitution. While the states have a general police power to do just about anything for health and safety and welfare, Congress doesn't. Congress's powers are limited and finite. And they're limited to the 20, was it 23 things listed in Article 1, Section 8. She mentioned a few of them. Laying taxes, regulating commerce, making post roads, you know, fairly, you know, interesting items. But what's unique, though, about the powers listed, uh, Hugo, let me ask you this question. Are the powers listed in Article 1, Section 8 Local in nature or national in nature? Um, Why are they national in nature? Um, we specifically gave those up to the national government to kind of, uh, I guess, for them to be able to do their job and regulate the balance of like, the states and things like that. Well, let me, let's do this one, Hugo. So it says to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states of Indian tribes. Is this a power we would want states to execute or the national government to execute? National. Why? Why, do, why would we want Congress, the national government, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states? That's the, that the basis of the union, I guess. Um, What's the problem, you go, if the states start doing that stuff? What's the problem if the states aren't regulating commerce with foreign nations and among the several states? I guess we'll have the same problem that we had with the Federation. They will start, I guess, any stronger states will take advantage of all the states. Good. Right? 
the things listed in Article 1, Section 8 are very national in nature. These are things which we would want the central government to do. If there's a commerce dispute between two states, we can't trust the states to regulate it. Think of the first case we did, Gibbons versus Ogden, right? You had New York essentially passing a law to prevent boats from New Jersey from traveling through its waters. That's a problem. It makes sense for Congress, as a central body, to pass laws that govern disputes between states. To build a postal system, right? It makes sense to have a central government to build a postal system. That way they can go up and down. Laying and collecting taxes. Well, remember with the articles, one of the problems was the states weren't collecting taxes. So it makes sense to give the federal Congress the power to do so. But let's not forget that the central government only has those powers delegated. And as I think we've discussed, all these powers are very national in nature. Uh, uh, Jason, is there any kind of... Um, Police power for the federal government. Does the police power have the ability, I'm sorry, does the federal government have the power to regulate health and safety laws in the Constitution? In the Constitution. Why not? Let's, let's, let's take an easy one. Let's say, uh, you know, we're in Houston, we have a building code, right? The, the building has to have fire escapes and has to have, you know, um, you know, exits and fire extinguishers, right? Is that something the state could enact, Jason? Yes. What if the Congress said, you know what, we think the states are not doing a good job with fire codes, let's make our own. Could Congress do that? Then they can do that. How? Uh, which, which one? Where do they get the power to implement the national fire code to protect the safety of people nationwide? I mean, yeah, necessary and proper. Is necessary and proper to what? To enforce the laws given. Or to enforce the powers uh, granted. Which power granted allows you to create a fire code? That's a great question. See, Jason's being a smart ass, and he's not, he's not answering my question. The answer is Commerce Clause, right? And everyone knows that. Today, the answer is Commerce Clause, and we'll get to that in, uh, in a few moments. But under the Constitution as it's written, and this is not a disputed point, Congress did not have a police power over local issues. They couldn't is issue a, a fire code or a labor code or a, or a wage law or whatever else. These were not the proper matters for federal intervention, right? And we often say this is like, oh, you know, they shouldn't. But Casey, why do you think the framers, in light of Federal Number 10, didn't want the federal government making local laws? What's the problem there? What happens when the Congress creates a law? How are they? How, when Congress passes a law, you're right. When Congress passes a law, how does it silence the people of the state? Well, it's kind of preempting. It's like What's preemption? When the federal government has a law, law. Very good. So, uh, Casey, I'll ask a follow up. When the feds pass a labor law, right, say. Say, you know, Congress passed a law saying you can't work more than 50 hours in a week. And in Texas, we are industrious folk, and we say, you know what? We should be able to work however many hours we damn well please. Dolores, you'll know this very soon, right? What does that do to Texas if they want people to work as many hours as they damn well please when Congress passes the maximum 50 hours a week law? It just, I don't know, we're not regulating our people, so it's taking Yes, and that's exactly right. So I said at the beginning, right, the police power was this whole thing of a pizza pie, right, this entire pie of power for the states. And the Constitution carved out a couple slices for the federal government. But when Congress makes those pieces bigger, it contracts the state pie. It actually shrinks the residual power of the states. So they've actually taken an entire area that was one subject to state control and taken away from the states, right? Further, it's a one-size-fits-all policy, right? Maybe people in, you know, you know, New York are lazy and they don't want to work 50 hours a week. Maybe they love this law, but maybe industrious Texans say, screw that, I'm going to work till my bones come off, right? I'm sure there people in this room will say that. You don't allow that to happen. <laughs> so when you have this expansion of national power, it uh, directly limits and cramps what the states can do. I wouldn't see that. 
So again, let's let's go back. Yes, yes, sir. And just and it relates back to the idea of factions to bring it full circle. Please, because the police power is local power, ah. and factions. You know, the local power with most directly close to the people is going to know what the faction in that region. Who's that more? Design. So, Jason, let me ask you this follow up: Who's more responsive? And this is a rhetorical question. Who's more responsive to various local needs, Congress or your state legislature in Austin? The, the closer the power is to the people, the more responsive. Why? Accountability. Yeah. And understanding. Yes. Yes. So another aspect of how this destroys factionalism is because it basically renders irrelevant people in all 50 states. As long as you have enough votes in Congress, they can impose a one-size-fits-all standard nationwide. And this shrinks the sovereignty of the states. Uh, there's an image which I often use, and some uh, I think I used it once before, is that when the Constitution was drafted, right, or I'll start like this. Today we often think of government as this pervasive thing, right? So we live in this sea of government regulation, and we try and swim around and try and avoid it. And you have these little dotted islands of freedom, these little dotted islands of liberty, like Staten Island perhaps, um, where I'm from. But as a Constitution was designed, it was the other way around. You have this massive sea of freedom where you have this residual power to do as you please. And you have these dotted islands of government. And where these dotted islands of government existed, you could you know, swim around them, but if you got stuck on it, you got stuck on it. And today it's been reversed 180 degrees out of phase. This is Professor Randy Barnett's metaphor, which I, I, uh, I enjoy using. So let's go to the 10th Amendment, right? Mike, read, read the 10th Amendment, please. Power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states respectively the laws of the people. Okay, thank you. So I highlight a couple parts because I want to I want you to actually think of what this means. Um, the court says in Darby that the Tenth Amendment is but a truism. Um, uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, so let's actually try and look at the words and rather just ignore it. So it begins, the power is not delegated, right? And I I, I put the answer up there. But, but Mike, where are powers delegated to the Constitution? Where where does Congress get its powers from? What part of the Constitution? Eight. Article one, section eight, right? <laughs> it lists twenty something things that Congress can do. So it says if something's not delegated to the central government, nor prohibited to it, and that's section ten, right? These are all the national things like making war and making treaties. The powers are reserved to the states and to the people, right? So Mike, let me ask this question. Let's use the example I had before, fire codes, right? Is there any power delegated to Congress to build a fire code, a nationwide fire code? Probably find one for the Commerce Clause. No, we're not Commerce Clause yet. We'll get, we'll, we'll get to the bastardization of the Commerce Clause later. But, but for now, <laughs> let's stick with the text, right? Does Congress have a power to build a fire code, a local fire code? No. Okay, right? Is there anything in Section 10 prohibiting a state from making like a fire code? Okay, so who has that power? The state. Good. It's a rule of construction. I mean, this is a, it's a rule of construction, same way you would interpret a contract. Unless something's given to the feds. Or if it's prohibited to the states, the states have it. And this merely codifies the point that when the states declared independence, they retained their residual sovereignty and only surrendered very specific aspects of their power to the national government. And if they did not surrender it, and the Constitution doesn't stop them from doing it, that means it's reserved to the states or to the people themselves. Okay? Kelsey, let me ask a different example. So about taxation, right? Does Congress have the power to tax in the in Article One, Section Eight? Yes. Yeah, it's like the first thing listed, right? They 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 didn't mess around with that one. That's very up top. Okay. Are the states prohibited from taxing? No. So who can tax in this case? Go. Both. Go. Ah, but now I'm a follow up, right? Can they tax the same thing? No. Well, think this through. Remember, do, do we do we do McCall in this case? McCall from Maryland. 
Yeah, we did McCulloch, right? What were the facts McCulloch? Do you remember? Lacey, remember? What were the facts McCulloch versus Maryland? Oh, come on. You guys got to McCulloch. Here you go. Yeah, Kelsey? Oh, no, not. Dad, go for it. Yeah. Maryland wanted to attack the U.S. bank. Okay, exactly. Oh, yeah. Maryland. Maryland tried to tax the federal bank. Right, Lacey, what was the problem with that? That it was the federal bank and the state couldn't tax it. I know, that was a holding, but why was it problematic for a f state of Maryland to tax the federal bank? Because Maryland couldn't tax it. Why? Think in terms of the Tenth Amendment. Because the bank was ruled by the, by the federal federalists. It was their power within the Constitution to have that bank there. Close. Angelina? Well, I think because it was a bank of, um, it was, I mean, it was a U.S. bank, right? It was a federal bank. Right. Um, Read the 10th Amendment. Is there anything in 10th Amendment that tells you that a state can't tax the federal government? Kelsey, you want to take a stab at it? Uh, is it kind of like saying that because uh, the United States, like, the federal government will trump the state's powers, that the federal government, because it's their thing, they have... Kind of like numbers to tax. Uh -huh. uh, Brandon, I think your hand was up a minute ago. I want to move on the right direction, but does it have to do with the fact that everyone pays into the federal government? So if this state is taxing that federal bank, that's good. Taking money from all the rest of the state. But look, look at the text of the Tenth Amendment, right? Is there? Any, yeah, here you go. I think I stab at it. Is it that? That powers were specifically reserved for Congress to raise like that. Oh, it was they a bank, though. So the federal government can tax. Right, and now we want to be mechanism for which they, they. Okay, getting closer. Gwen, you have any thoughts? The states are given the power to. Okay, let, let's, let's go like this, right? Gwen, let me ask a question like this. At the 1776, Right? The states had this huge body of authority to do just about anything they wanted in their states. Do they have any authority over a federal government? No. Ah. Did the police power ever include from 1776 this power for the federal government? No, just the states themselves. Okay. And this is the basis of preemption which Casey mentioned, right? The, the states never had a police power over the federal government. That didn't exist in 1776. They never had it. It didn't exist. This was never a power delegated because it never existed beforehand. And someone said supremacy clause. That's 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 right. The supremacy clause. We go to Article Six, right? Page uh, thirty-five. The Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land. That what's the significance then of the supremacy clause? What is that effectively saying? If there is a collision between state law and federal law on the same subject, then federal law. Yes. But the reason for this is, is more fundamental. The, the, the supremacy clause restates what's obvious. The states never had the authority to regulate the federal government. They never had that power. So, of course, when the states want to do something and the feds do something else, the states don't have the power to trump them. And this is one aspect of our federal system that was very important. Right? So whatever power is not delegated to the United States, the states reserve. But if the states never had the power in the first place, they can't regulate it. Right? Everyone get that? And, and this is why we have a case like uh, uh, Gibbons versus Ogden. Right? So Eddie, what was the law at issue in Gibbons? What was the law there? What did what did New York try to uh, try to pull? Um, they were trying to uh, prohibit the neighboring states, New Jersey, yep, from uh, from utilizing their waterways for trade purposes. Good. So specifically, though, what was the law that New York enacted? Very very precisely. If I remember correctly, it had to do with. 
I think I'm mixing it up. That's right. PJ? Um, thinking, doesn't it say New York gave a certain guy the authority to license? Yes, to give him a monopoly. That's exactly right. So basically, New York gave this one guy a monopoly saying, okay, there's this new invention called the steamboat. You know, it's all the rage, right? It's the coolest new thing. <laughs> Full of hot air, if you ask me. But uh, you have, they gave one guy a monopoly saying, you are the only one who's allowed to bring a steamboat into New York Harbor. Okay, so then you had a guy from Jersey, of course, had other ideas because he's from New Jersey. He's like, screw that. I'm going to pump my fist and pull into New York Harbor from Elizabeth, right? People are laughing at what I'm talking about. Um, the problem was a New York court issued an injunction saying that you are not allowed to pull into New York Harbor. Okay. <coughs> uh, Michael, was there actually in this case any conflict between state and federal law? Is there actually any conflict? Um, Congress had some sort of act. Mm -hmm. Licensing ships. Ah, good. But did this law decide where ships could travel or not? No, not, not that. Mm. So, is there actually any conflict between federal and state law? I think you answered it right. What's the actual answer? Not really. So, why did John Marshall seem to think there was one? Mmm. Right? This is the part of the case that John Marshall doesn't want you to ask about. Zach, what do you think? Why did Marshall, you know, why was this case? And we think, listen, if Congress wanted to, they could pass a law saying all boats can travel wherever they want. But Congress hasn't done that. Why, why does he rule still in favor of the, uh, of the guy from Jersey? I mean, I think that he wanted to expand the interpretation of the Commerce Clause. It's, it's actually a little bit more subtle than that, right? It wasn't just he wanted to expand the scope of the Commerce Clause. What was he trying to do to the states? He's trying to limit their ability to regulate commerce themselves, interstate commerce. Yes. Okay. And th I, think, I think that's the right answer, right? There was no actual federal law that was being uh, conflicted with the state law, right? That, that didn't exist. But what was at issue here was a collision where Congress could regulate, right? Uh, Ian, if Congress wanted, could they have passed a law saying all ships from New York to New Jersey must have free travel? Could they have passed that law? Yes. But they didn't. So what Marshall saying is, if a state could have, I'm sorry, if Congress could have acted here, that's sufficient. In other words, if Congress could have passed a law, that's enough to preempt state law. Everyone get what I just said? This is what became known as the Dormant Commerce Clause. Dormant like, you know, sleeping. If Congress could act, if Congress could act, that means the states are incompetent to act there. And I'll give you a recent example. There was a case about 10 years ago called Granholm v. Held, H-E-A-L-D. It involved wine. So Virginia passed a law saying we are not allowing anyone to ship wine directly to people. We have to go to a liquor store to buy it. Right? Why did Virginia pass this law? Well, they were afraid of all these mi miners ordering like Pinot Grigio and I guess, I don't know, miners can get much worse, I suppose. But, you know, they, they don't want all this, you know, expensive wine being shipped. The real reason why they have this law is to protect wine sellers in the state. Because that way you have to go to a wine store and pick up the bottle and you have to actually promote, pay tax on it. Okay? But safety, whatever, right? For the children, always think of the children drinking, you know, <laughs> drinking some Blanc or whatever, right? Okay, so what the Supreme Court said, this was an, a regulation on interstate commerce, right? Virginia was banning shipments of wine from out of state. Had Congress passed any law in this area? Had Congress ever said that states are required to allow shipment of wine? No. Could. Congress have passed a law in this area. Yeah, the law is unconstitutional, right? Because Congress could have acted, the law is invalid. Brandon, you're shaking your head, I think. 
it seem kind of extreme. Why why does it seem extreme to you? Would, I just think it opens the door to a lot of we could do this, so it's a lot of easier to grab out of yeah, it's a really big pie now, right? And now there's, there's just there are crumbs in the outside at this point. Uh, I, I mean, Brandon's intuition is correct. In fact, if you're interested, in, look up the decision. Justice Thomas has a dissent. Um, he doesn't believe the Dormant Commerce Clause exists. He thinks John Marshall made it up, uh, and he might be right about that. But but he he's alone in thinking this, right? So what Marshall was effectively saying, right? was that we have a national government in any realm where you have some sort of intercourse, some sort of activity that bleeds into another state, Congress could regulate, therefore the states are incompetent to regulate. Now when I say incompetent, I don't mean they're stupid, I mean they're unable to, they're not, they, they can't do it, right? Yes, Eddie? Can you explain to me the reason for the designation dormant? <coughs> Sleeping, slumbering. It's, 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 a, it's a power lying in wait where Congress could exercise it, but they're not. And it only comes to where when there's a conflict between the states. So effectively what happened was there was a state law saying you can't ship wine, and a number of wine growers sued saying the law is unconstitutional. And they said not that it violated any federal law, but it violated the dormant commerce clause because Congress could Act. <laughs> you could say that. Well, I mean, John Marshall said it 200 years ago. All right, so they're citing Marshall and Gibbons. That's what? I'm sorry, Mike? Yeah, it's basically only triggered when someone follows a lawsuit, right? There's no law in the books, right? They're not saying that this Virginia statute conflicts with the Federal Wine Growers Act or something like that. They're saying, if Congress wanted to, they could pass a National Wine Growers Act, but they haven't, but let's sue on it anyway. It's an odd doctrine, and I, I think Brandon had a fair point. We said it makes the pie a lot bigger because it severely shrinks what a state can do to protect themselves. Uh, let me give you another example that uh, my students this morning asked about marijuana. Okay, The state of Colorado has legalized pot. As if people in Boulder needed anything else to smoke, now they can do it legally, right? And those boulders literally stoned. <laughs> there it is, right? Uh, anyway, so what happened? The border states, basically Nebraska and Oklahoma, or Nebraska and Kansas, I can't remember. But anyway, the border states, Colorado, are complaining because all the people on the border are driving across with pot. In other words, if you live in the border of Colorado, you hop across the border and you buy. Same with fireworks, right? Everyone knows you always, if you ever go like on the, if you know the Pennsylvania Turnpike, right in the Ohio border, you have the firework place, right? She knows. So, right, in Texas, you buy your own fireworks, it doesn't matter. But, but in New York, you can't buy fireworks. You basically drive right to the Pennsylvania border, you drive across the border, you buy your fireworks, you come home. So Colorado is selling all this dope, right? And the state's saying, you're basically sending all this, this marijuana into our states. What happened? It actually happened that Oklahoma and Kansas have sued Colorado in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction, claiming that selling a marijuana is a nuisance, a common law nuisance of sending across state lines. Uh, the loss is, is kind of ridiculous, but if you think about what's actually happening there, right? why is Colorado able to sell those drugs with impunity? The federal government, the Justice Department is not enforcing drug laws. In a normal universe where the take care clause means what it says, people will be prosecuted for buying marijuana. But the administration decided that we're not going to enforce this law because of states' rights. See, it's actually one of these weird oddities that where the Department of Justice has discovered states' rights is to allow states to decriminalize marijuana. That's about it. Jason? And it happened at the exact same time in which the Justice Department also, when you have like the I was licensed case uh -huh. where they argued the exact opposite. Where there was there is a, a federal rule, so they said the state that's dormant commerce because it's, they couldn't manage it, and so Arizona doesn't have the power to do. So what Jason is talking about is a 2012 decision called Arizona versus United States SB 1070, if you will. This was the stop and show your papers law. So Arizona said, "Listen, the feds aren't enforcing immigration laws. We want to help." So in other words, if we pull someone over and we have suspicion they're not here legally. We can ask for their papers, 
and detain them so long as necessary to find out if they're here legally. And if they're not here legally, we hand them over to the feds, right? The Justice Department. Well, there was an existing program for them to send the paperwork. It was fair. It could have been 20, 30 minutes, but it would taken some time, right? So rather than saying, "Oh, thanks for your help, guys," the Justice Department sued, saying that this violates federal law, violates the supremacy clause, because they're interfering with federal law enforcement. And the Supreme Court agreed, right? The states can't do stuff which ostensibly helps the feds because it gets in their way. The marijuana law, opposite of the federal law. It's no, it, it doesn't. Yeah, the marijuana one's really tricky. We discussed the take care clause last week. Um, I think there's a very colorful argument there's a violation of the take care clause by failing to enforce drug laws. But you see, what's interesting is we're not just talking about people who have possession. Those states have legalized marijuana businesses to actually sell this dope. What if that business wants to open up a bank account or invest? Mm -hmm. Dad, what happens if they want my dad's in the business? Why won't, why won't they allow it? Because they, that law could change. Well, have the there's been no law though. It's an executive policy. So effectively, imagine if you know Bank of America starts giving bank accounts to all these marijuana dispensaries, and then 2016, President Ted Cruz comes and says, "Oh, just kidding, guys. I'm going to indict all of you for 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 dealing with illegal drugs. You're all handcuffs. Go." So no business is stupid enough to break the law. Stoners don't care. They'll do whatever, right? <laughs> but businesses are smart than that. They're not going to risk running a statute of limitations for a federal felony. So you have this. But it also makes it a cash business, which the state doesn't Which is very to. dangerous. It's very hard to, for the state to enforce its taxing power. Yeah, the states are in a, they're screwed. They didn't think this through. That's Chi Chin Chang was up in smoke. So, um, I don't like marijuana jokes. Okay. All right. So that's the issue. That's one of the issues in Gibbons, right? The other issue is what does commerce mean? Uh, who was I up to? I forgot. Did I? I think I called you, Brandon. Chris, what? How does Marshall define commerce? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. He, he, he had a broad definition of commerce, I think. Okay. Okay, so does he limit it to actually trade? How do we know he doesn't limit it to trade? What's, what's, what were the actual facts of this case? What was going on? What, what was being, uh, what was on those steamboats? What do you think was being transported from New York to New Jersey? Yeah. Wasn't very far. Dad, what do you think was tra transported? People! People, thank you, Dad. Right? People. This was a mode of conveyance. If you wanted to go from New York to New Jersey, you would take the steamboat. It was a fairly short ride. Right? Right across the Hudson River. Are people, Chris, commerce? Why do you say no? Well, in my definition, I would say that they're commerce. I think commerce is more narrow. Okay, so he defines commerce, uses this word intercourse, right? It basically describes the, the exchange of people, of items, of anything. But he limits it to navigation, right? He says, when you have the navigable waters of the United States, you have these rivers, and people are literally going from one state to another, that's commerce. Everyone see that? But where the opinion starts going off the rails, it's not the definition of commerce. It's a definition of among. Uh, Colin, how does he define among? Um, intermingled with? Intermingled, what? Intermingled. Good, yeah, what the heck does that mean? Instead of the, I guess as opposed to. Let me ask you this question, Colin. Is there any doubt that 
a boat ride from New York to New Jersey is interstate commerce. Is there any, is there any doubt that's interstate? Okay. What happens if the uh, if the boat went along the coastline of New Jersey and never never went into New York? Would that be interstate? Just follow the coast, went down to the Jersey Shore. I set up for that one. Assist to myself, yes. So we mentioned intercourse and the Jersey Shore in the same <laughs> sentence or <thing. laughs> I actually made that joke this morning, but uh, you, you can have it this time. Actually, this morning I said in, intermingling intercourse is like a dirty game of Twister. <laughs> That's all. It is. <laughs> Check for broken needles and bottles in the sand. <laughs> My mom's shaking her head. Literally. <laughs> you always say, "Would you say this in front of your mother?" Well, as it turns out, yes. <laughs> so right. So he would say, "You have these navigable waters. The waters flow between the states, right?" So what Marshall says, which is interesting is he realizes that if he limits this to only boat rides between states, the power won't go very far. There are only so many boat rides or rail, I don't think there are even trains at this point, but there are only so many ways of traveling between state lines. Most commerce is gonna be within one state, right? Most manufacturing, most farming, it's within one state. So what he says is, it does not have to be completely internal, right? The word is among between, intermingled. So if there's some commerce in one state that bleeds into another state, Congress can regulate it. So it doesn't mean that it's necessarily with people from different states or intermingling in different states. Even if you slightly go across the border or travel in some way, it still, it still makes an impact. I mean, it's that that's the argument Marshall makes, right? Marshall defines commerce fairly broadly, and he defines among fairly broadly. So anything that might have some sort of a, uh, you know, connection with a different state, Marshall would find that it's appropriate. Okay, we won't get the general gist. Now, what's interesting, though, and again, there was no law by Congress attempting to regulate commerce. Congress didn't actually attempt to regulate commerce until the turn of the 20th century, 1880s, 1890s, right? Remarkably, we went over 130 years in this country without Congress trying to regulate local economic matters. Hugo, what changed? Uh, technology. More, yeah. What changed? What happened that would give the federal government a greater interest in regulating commerce? Civil War. Uh, after the Civil War, Jason, you have an idea? Um, industrial Revolution. Very good. What happened with the Industrial Revolution? Just the size, scope, and scale of industry, mm -hmm. you know, increased exponentially, mm -hmm. which made it, uh, which made commerce in between intercourse, interchange, in between the states, much more common and regular. All right, Jason, let me ask you this follow-up question. Were the states particularly eager to uh, put limits on the Industrial Revolution? Some of them were, depending on their local uh, economies. Their what local the other ones? Well, they want to, they of course want to do increase it. Yeah, think of Texas back in the day when to drill for oil, you won't say the word environmentalism, right? <laughs> you, don't, you won't say the word, you know, uh, uh, green. You say drill, baby, drill, and you let them go, <laughs> right? This was effectively the, the philosophy of the late 19th and early 20th century. We have all this great technology, all this great industry, uh, let it go, let it go. Um, we're not gonna try and stop it. Um, this is often pejoratively described as laissez-faire, which is a term I don't like, but it really means hands off, right? Don't, 
mess with these various businesses. But there was a movement in the United States government, in the United States called the progressives. You don't know about the progressive movement? Progressives, Eddie, you're, you're smirking. Tell me about the progressives. So they were um, more optimistic regarding power and control and uh -huh. types of things. I what, what, they, what was their main goal? What were they trying to do? I want to say control, but it wasn't control. Oh, that's exactly right. <laughs> don't, don't be nice. You're right. Progressives, as today, they want control, right? They want to control the industry. They want to control the economy. And their motives perhaps were good. They were probably socialists, but that's that side for the moment. Their goals were we want to help people, right? We want to have, you know, minimum wage laws. Under society. We want to have maximum hour laws. We want to have laws protecting child labor. We want to have law protecting women in the workplace. We want to use the arm of the state to, like Jason said, make a better society. Whether it's actually better or worse, we can argue with that later. I don't think it is. But they were trying to do various things to improve society and achieve more equitable working conditions. Okay, We can debate the merits, but that's not very important right now. They ran into several problems, though, when they tried to use the federal government to achieve these policy objectives, right? Uh, 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 Casey, what, what were these problems when they tried to use the power of the federal government to achieve various progressive ends? Well, what happens when Congress tried passing various progressive laws? But what were the cases discussed in the late 18 and early 1900s? It was a series of cases. Well, we'll get to the details in a moment, but what constitutional power, Casey, gives Congress the ability to regulate safety laws, health laws, our laws? Was that the right answer in the 1880s? The Gibbons v. Ogden, which again was probably the only Commerce Plus press in the books for 75 years, right? Or about 60 years. The Gibbons v. Ogden justify these economic rules. Well, what did the Supreme Court think at first? Um, the court just, like, okay. Mike, let me ask you this question. Under Gibbons, right, even under Marshall's broad definition of Gibbons, would a person working in one state and drawing a salary in one state have been interstate commerce or, as you said, intermingled intercourse, as we say in Jersey? person working in one state making some product, would his wages be commerce under Marshall's definition? Uh, in one state, not traveling around? Never leaves a state, never leaves a county. No. Why not? Because it's... Inside the state, it's not involved in commerce. Okay, so here's the situation, right? Even under Marshall's very, very broad definition of interstate commerce, you st you still need some intercourse that has some effect in a foreign state. Yeah, yeah. If you are a worker sitting in a farm and you are plowing in one state, and you never even leave the county. Even under Gibbons. You're, you're out of luck. You can't regulate that person. Right? Kelsey, who's the only power that can regulate that farmer sitting in a county plowing? That state. And what happens if the state decides not to enact um, certain uh, progressive laws? That the federal government are trying to put in place? Yeah. Well, that's what the states are not interested in passing those laws. I mean, I guess the government are kind of like funding. Well, they're kind of screwed. There wasn't, there wasn't much funding yeah. back then. So because progressives, as Eddie said, like to control things, they said, you know what? We can't have this with all 50 states making different rules. They're not progressive enough. We need a one-size-fits-all standard to make sure that everyone behaves like we want them to. They tried, and they passed a series of laws. And there were a number of court cases where the Supreme Court was grappling with this. And put yourself in the minds of the Supreme Court, right? 
they see this industrial revolution. They see that society is changing very quickly. And they see that a lot of people perhaps want to uh, uh, make conditions better. But they lack the ability to do that. They can't do it. So, Lacey, let me ask you this question. How should the Supreme Court rule when they see that there's a pressing social problem and it's pretty clear the Constitution, as interpreted by John Marshall even, doesn't get you there? What should the Supreme Court do there? What should they or what did they do? I'm asking what should they do. There's a serious pressing problem. You have children getting crushed in factories. You have all this horrible child labor and whatever else. People getting paid very low wages, and people want to help. How should the Supreme Court react to these kinds of social pressures? Well, if the states aren't regulating as they should, then they should get involved. Who's they? The feds. Should the court sanction that? Assuming for the moment, which I think was the belief back then, that Congress couldn't do these things. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, no. Why? Because there's harm to everybody. So should the court shift their interpretation of the Constitution based on pressing social needs? What's the danger of that? I guess then that ends up giving them too much power. And then what happens? They have all the power. Then there's no balance. So what's interesting, uh, Kelsey? I think if they change the interpretation of the Constitution every time that there is a change in society, that they'll have all these different like rules that they come up with that aren't going to be applicable in different time periods. So. Okay. Let's go back to our Tenth Amendment, right? All right. The Tenth Amendment was premised on this pizza pie we discussed, right? We have this huge pie of power for the states. And they have this small sliver for the federal government, right? As you increase the size of the federal pie, the state pie has to shrink. It's a fixed sovereignty. You can't get around that. Um, Angelina, let me ask you this question. What's the cost to individual freedom of making that federal pie bigger? And be, let's be very precise. What is the downside of giving more power to the federal government. What's the cost in terms of separation of powers? I think individual liberty is restricted um, much more than I'm sure the framers intended. Well, I think that's the right answer, but why? Why is individual liberty restricted when more power is aggrandized or collected in the federal government? Well, the pie is only so big, so if you start removing some of the power in one area, keeping it to, to another side. I mean, the pie only is so... Yeah, but you're talking about power. I'm talking about rights. Why is it that giving more power to Congress shrinks individual rights? I think at least one person's writing the paper on this topic. Okay. Gwen, why is it that when more power... And you can think back to Federalist 10. When more power is concentrated in a single government, the federal government, and taken away from the states... Why does that negatively impact individual liberty? Well, it takes rights away, or a portion of rights away from the people. And well, it takes away power from the people. Yes. Yes. Federal is 10. What did James Madison say? Right? He said the way to prevent tyranny is to have all these different factions fighting against each other. And our system was structured that you have all these various factions. You have factions at the state level, you have factions at the federal government, you have factions in this and that, and all these people can fight. By imposing a single one-size-fits-all standard, you just removed like 90% of the factionalism. Right? So instead of having 50 state capitals fighting about this issue, you go to Austin, you go to, uh, you know, uh, 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 Harrisburg, you go to uh, you know Baton Rouge, wherever you want to go, you have different state capitals fighting over these issues. You've now just preempted that, and you have a single standard, one size fits all. So it's often said in Supreme Court decisions that uh, structure is important to protect individual freedom. Most people don't actually understand what that means. They don't even get why. And I think to answer the question of why structure protects freedom, you need to go back to Madison and Federalist Number 10, that the reason why we have these separation of powers 
It's not because they're nice, not because we like states. It's because they serve a really good purpose of promoting freedom because you have more people fighting each other and that way there's less government. Okay. Now, I'm not saying this is an ideal form of government, but this is how Madison is described, and I think it's a fairly good suggestion of how our Constitution was originally designed. But the question I posed to um, uh, Lacey a minute ago is, a, is an important one. Societies change, right? Our agrarian agricultural society in the 18th century was world's way. Look out, you have a window, right? Look out your window. You have these tall buildings. You have workers running around. We have convention centers. We have, you know, light rail. If anyone actually rides it, right? You have all these different things. What do we do, uh, Dad? What do we do when we have this philosophy from Madison about having all this factionalism, having these states and this and that, and then we have these very important pressing societal needs where, you know, it might make sense to have a single nationwide standard for building codes or a single nationwide standard for labor, right? How do we... How do we deal with these with these circumstances? That's when we need to balance between the fight and the uh, the need to have one uh, uniform regulation because fighting is good. But if you just let them fight all together, everyone gonna you know lose in blood and they all die. Well, short of everyone dying, let me ask you this question a different way, Dad. Um, I don't even want to die. Uh, so I'm sure everyone's dying. What do we do when our constitution becomes outmoded? When it no longer fits the circumstances of the day? What happens? What's, what should happen then? And the question I asked to Lacey was, should the judges just let the language be distorted beyond meaning? Uh, no, because the constitution has the ability to be amended. 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 Look at that Article 5, right? Imagine that. Amending the Constitution, gee whiz, right? <laughs> if two-thirds of Congress agrees and three-fourths of states agree, you can change the Constitution. Imagine that, right? You can actually change the Constitution when two-thirds of the states, I'm sorry, two-thirds of Congress and three-fourths of states agree. And our Constitution has been amended, what, 27 times? Um, among world constitutions, we have probably one of the shortest ones in the world, and it's the longest serving one. So people always say, see, our constitution has stayed the same for 200 years, hasn't really changed. Well, that, that, that isn't exactly true, right? Under the auspices of the judicial branch, uh, our constitution has changed significantly. And you see this in the progression of the cases from, uh, you know, Gibbons to Darby. You can just see what happens there? Eddie, uh, 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 I'll go in a second, but um, we'll discuss in a few minutes President Roosevelt's attempts to pack the court. But the people in the New Deal recognized what they were doing. They knew that they were trashing the Constitution. So a guy named uh, Rexford Tugwell, it's an awesome name, he worked for Roosevelt in his brain trust and he said, quote, our New Deal policies require a, quote, tortured interpretation of a document intended to prevent them. A tortured interpretation of a document intended to prevent them. So the people in the New Deal recognized what they're doing. They weren't idiots. Right? They weren't stupid. They understood that they were doing stuff that the Constitution explicitly forbid. Like they, they, they knew exactly what they were doing. Okay? And during the New Deal, Congress agreed. Congress acquiesced. Eddie, why do you think Congress was so eager to uh, let Roosevelt do whatever he wanted to do and roll all over them? Wondering if it's because um, that was a different different vision so mm. to me. Explain more. Uh, on the federal level, they have more of a collectivist group concern mm -hmm. as opposed to the local 
which was more concerned with individual issues. And I'm not sure I answered. What? What? Well, let me, let me let me steer you a different way. What was going on in the United States during the New Deal? At, before the war. And what was FDR's approach to handling the depression? Very strong. Intervention. Federal intervention, right? Federal yeah. So during the New Deal, and we'll discuss the New Deal a lot in this class, it's probably the most important periods of constitutional history. The president tried to implement a number of expansive federal programs that changed our entire structure of government. Um, he argued that if we don't do this, our country will go deep into a depression. Um, I should give you an economics lesson. Uh, believe it or not, the New Deal programs worsened the Great Depression. They prolonged it. The United States would have recovered much faster had he not redistributed all that money and did all these stupid programs that didn't accomplish much. Lots of bridges were built, whatever, but he actually prolonged the Great Depression. So uh, FDR just rolled over everyone. But um, let's just, we're not going to judge the wisdom of his programs. That's not what we're here for. What Roosevelt said was, if we don't do this, something very bad will happen. And for some time, the Supreme Court pushed back against Roosevelt. So we have this dynamic over and over again. The president wants to amass power, and the Congress is not willing to fight him for it. All right? TJ, what happens in this case again and again where the president's trying to shift more power to himself and the Congress isn't willing to vote against it, that the Congress is willingly giving away this power? What what what, what happens then? Yeah. They let him exercise powers that are not his. What happens there? Do. And what do the courts do in these cases? Um, they're gonna get mad at um, and but what do they do? Uh, this is a question I asked Lacey before. What do the courts do when you have a popular president who's trying to take actions to purportedly save the union, and then you have a Congress who's in his pocket giving whatever he wants? What is a judge to do in the Supreme Court? Mike, what do you think? What's a judge do in those cases? I mean, we start from the premise that the Constitution does not allow these laws, right? There's, there's not, even if you take Gibbons v. Ogden to its furthest extreme, the president can't implement fair labor codes on chickens in Brooklyn, right? This is not, this is not even the ballpark of interstate commerce. What do you do as a judge at that point? Declare the Constitution. And what happens when the judges of the Supreme Court in the 1930s were declaring various aspects of the New Deal unconstitutional? How did, how did our dear leader respond? What did, what did Roosevelt, Mike? He proposed the deal where he would get um, 15 justices, possibly. What, it's called the court packing scheme. Switch in time. It's the switch in time, not stitch. He said, all right, you know what, justices? You're not ruling the way I want. I'm going to replace you. There's nothing in this Constitution that says there are nine in the Supreme Court. That's nowhere written. It could be more. So he said, you know what? You have all these old men. Anyone over 70, I get to replace. Add five new justices. Give me a permanent majority. Michael, is there anything stopping him from doing that? If Congress agrees with him, is there anything to stop him? If Congress disagrees with him? Congress agrees. They're like, yeah, whatever. Put on all these new guys. Nothing to stop them. So, Zach, again, if you're a judge in the Supreme Court and you learn that the president is threatening to effectively replace you by putting on five of his stooges, and these are going to be sycophants. I mean, he ultimately, Roosevelt appointed think, nine justices of the Supreme Court over his tenure, right? What do you do if you're a judge in the Supreme Court? I 
What do you do? I'm talking to you. Uh, personally, I would do my job. <laughs> Why? What would, you, what would you actually do? Um, anything that's brought to the docket uh, and litigated in front, uh, I would think you interpret the Constitution in a way that it's meant to be interpreted. And it sounds uh -huh. like although Congress is going along with this, uh, they're placing kind of a false hope. Do you go? I think you raised your hand. Nothing. Well, you don't know, you're here. You're here. Retired. Reti well, that that be pension to the house. Well, let me tell you a funny story about pensions. So there's a guy named Willis Van de Vant, or no, I'm uh, sorry, James McReynolds. He was an SOB, right? He was a huge anti-Semite. He would not even sit in the same room as William Brandeis or Louis Brandeis. He wouldn't even look at him, right? He was a judge of the court. He hated Jews, hated blacks, hated everyone. He was actually considering retiring when Roosevelt came into office. But Roosevelt, in a terribly boneheaded move, cut the pensions of the justices. And they said, screw this, not retiring. Because they threatened to cut his pension, McReynolds stayed on and voted against Roosevelt for years. If they just left his pension in place, we would have never had a court backing scheme. I'm not joking. It's, it's, it's history. But uh, let me ask this question to you, Ian. What would the cost of democracy have been if FDR went through with this court packing scheme, what would, what, I think PJ said, what precedent would that have set for the future? And what would a future president do if any branch had gotten its way? So you're faced with a choice, right? You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You can either sacrifice the Commerce Clause, give in, and say, all right, go ahead and regulate the entire country. Or you can stand your ground, let the president basically appoint five new judges to the court, and set a terrible precedent for the future, where any president doesn't get what he wants can just blow sh stuff up. Sorry. <laughs> it's not an easy choice, Brandon. It's not an easy call at all, because either way, something bad's going to happen. So what do you do here? Taking your pension to the house. You take your pension to the house. He replaces you with another sycophant, and you know it's easy. Mm -hmm. Chris, what do you think? What do you do in this situation? It's not an easy choice. You can either let the president pervert the Commerce Clause to do whatever he damn well pleases, or let him replace you and set a precedent for the future that you can ignore the courts when they don't agree. Just 15, why not 20, why not 30, right? Just keep putting more. Put mandatory retirement ages, right? They, they, you know, they keep their pension, but they won't decide any cases. What do you do? You gotta find some way to justify what he's doing. And is that what the court did? Uh, I think so. Yeah. So, and you can have entire dissertations and courses on the New Deal, but I tried this little discussion to summarize um, the thought process that would run through a judge's mind. I'm talking about one judge in particular. His name is Justice Roberts. Not John Roberts, but Owen Roberts. The irony, right? So the guy named Owen Roberts, he was a Republican appointee to the court, uh, kind of a moderate guy, but in the early parts of the 1930s, he would rule with the conservatives to invalidate FDR's programs. But then there was one case, West Coast Hotel versus Parish. It was a minimum wage law from Washington, w w Wenatchee, Washington, if I remember correctly. It was a hotel uh, in Washington State. And originally... Justice Roberts voted to invalidate the minimum wage law. But there was a switch, the switch in time that saved the nine justices, where Justice Roberts changed his vote to uphold the law. It's funny how history repeats itself. Uh, well, John Roberts has a, has a lineage. He's more John Roberts than, uh, Owen Roberts than John Marshall, in my opinion. But... 
they switched. The Supreme Court blinked. And after West Coast Hotel v. Parrish, all the 5-4 decisions that had previously gone against the government now went in favor of the government. Roosevelt won, right? He stared them down, and he confronted them with a choice. You can either accept this tortured vision of the Constitution, which is consistent with what people want, or you can cling to the text of this document, and I will replace you, and I will blow up the separation of powers. Colin, what do you think of this choice? It's not an, e it's not an easy choice to be on the Supreme Court in the 1930s. Not an easy one. take that, if you were to take what happened then and I mean, I just there's got, there's no easy I know there's, there's no not easy way out. that's why you guys get paid the big bucks to be lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. So Kyle, let me ask you this question did this compromise even work did this save the separation of powers? Did this decision made in 1936 save the rest of the Constitution? They sacrificed the Commerce Clause. Did it save the rest of the document? Yes. Did it? The separation of powers that Madison discusses, are those in place today? And what did the New Deal do to those? Hugo, what do you think? Was this the last line in the sand? Did the president stop with the Commerce Clause and say, all right, I'm good, I got what I need? Yeah. What happened? Yeah, what happened next, uh, uh, Colin? Is that when they went to the, um, the Labor Act? With the, the yeah. Labor Act so, could have so, so, yeah, so if you want to talk about bullying, right? It's a hot topic, bullying, right? Facebook, whatever, but you have electoral bullying. When you give in an inch, they take a mile. So by sacrificing the Commerce Clause and by sacrificing other aspects of substantive due process and other things, the court rolled over. And they said, all right, we're not going to get in your way. And that transformed our country in many ways. Now, maybe you can say it's good or bad. But the supposition that if we just let this go, everything else will be okay, wasn't going to fly. That once you give in to the progressive mindset that whatever benefits a common good is okay, the separation of powers that Madison spoke of disappear very, very quickly. They vanish. They're, they're gone. And then we discuss a case like Schechter Poultry, the sick chicken case, which is in your notes. Right? This case, which was mentioned even a paragraph in your book, right? But in this case, we have the National Recovery Act, the NRA. Not, not that NRA. This is the National Recovery Act. And this bill gave to the president the power to make these labor codes that specified very specifically how all business must be transacted. This is how you kill chickens. You have to wait this much. You have to have these conditions. You have to have these wages. The president was making very specific labor codes. Right? This was purely a matter of state law. But beyond being a matter of state law, who has the power to make laws? The Congress. What did the National Recovery Act do? It delegated lawmaking power to the executive. This was the non-delegation doctrine which we've discussed, that Congress has the power to make laws and they can't delegate that to the executive. <coughs> right? In Schechter Poultry, by a 9-0 decision, the Supreme Court unanimously said, no mas, no mas. You cannot give up your power, Congress. Stop this, don't be stupid. Because once you give up your power, you don't get it back. After the New Deal, in various cases, the Supreme Court basically reversed that. They never reversed check to culture. They basically ignored it. And they said, yeah, if the Congress wants to give their power to the executive to make laws, go for it. That brings us to where we are today. 
we effectively have an administrative state that can make laws, and Congress wants nothing to do with it. It's easier for them. So the difficult decisions made during the New Deal um, set the tone and the stage uh, for the remainder of the 20th century. And it allowed our government to flourish and grow as it is here, right? But it, at the same time, diminished the sovereignty of the states, and if you believe James Madison, ultimately the individual liberty of the people. Okay? So any questions on the Commerce Clause? No? Okay. In our remaining few minutes, let's talk about the Ninth Amendment for a second, which is something which most common law books ignore, but the simple reason is it doesn't really mean anything anymore. But let's talk about this for a second. When the uh, framers were in the Constitutional Convention in 1787, one of the big debates was whether we need a Bill of Rights. Okay. Jason, do you know why some of the framers were opposed to having a Bill of Rights? Because they were specifically afraid that enumerating certain rights would be seen as denying others, or, or seeing that the others did not, in fact, exist when they did. Very good. So look at the Bill of Rights, right? Oh, by the way, I think I blew your minds right like this, but uh, Casey, does the Constitution confer any rights on people? See if you remember this answer. What does it do? Um, it just separates the powers. What does the Bill of Rights do? Does it confer any rights on people? Yeah. Read the First Amendment. Go it's on page uh, 42, 43. Just, just start reading the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. You can stop there, OK? So what right is protected by the sentence you just read? How would we describe that right? Um, Freedom, freedom of um, religion, right? Casey, is there anything in what you just read that says the people have the right to free religion? The people have the right to free speech. Is that listed anywhere in what you just read? No. Yes. Okay. This is an important nuance that people don't understand. And actually, your book made the mistake. Your book writes that the Bill of Rights confers rights on people. I sent a note to my friend as an editor saying, please change that because it's wrong. I did. I, we're friends, but we, I email more corrections up because there's some typos, right? No, they appreciate them because they, they, it's easier for me to find them than, right? Bray, he's, he's, he's one I know. He's a cool guy. Um, there are no rights conferred in the Bill of Rights. That's why I don't even like the phrase Bill of Rights. It's a bad, it's a bad phrase. What the Constitution, the first eight amendments do is a place limits on the power of the government to infringe these rights. That's look, Congress shall make no law respecting established religion. Okay, so Congress can't do this. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, right? So you have this, you can't infringe the right to bear arms. Mike, let me ask you a tricky question. If the first eight amendments don't confer rights on people, where do these rights come from? Oh. We said this, and Casey was correct. There's nowhere in the Constitution that says you have the right to free speech. All it says is Congress can't limit your free speech. So I asked the question, where in the Constitution is there, or where is anywhere that people have the right to free speech? Where do we get this from as people? I would say it's implied. Implied from what? Mm. Sovereignty. Well, we said that the powers of the states are from the sovereignty. When they declared independence, whatever powers were from the King of England transferred to the states. We're not talking about powers here, we're talking about rights. Where do these rights and liberties come from, Mike? God. 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 What do you think, Kelsey? Where do these rights come from? Well, I want to say assume. I think they took the language of the Constitution and maybe just assumed the opposite. Since they can't limit it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Hugo, what's your hands up? Uh, this might be silly, but the residual liberties of the people. They have the residual. Interesting. 
And what were these, uh, you may know the answer to this, what were the various liberties that Englishmen held? Englishmen. Englishmen. Oh, uh, King had to had do whatever he wants. What were the liberties that Englishmen held? Uh, they, uh, anyone, anyone know the answer? Anyone have an idea? Eddie, your hand's twitching. I'm, I'm just thinking, not answering your question, right? That's fine. Natural law is that? Ooh, natural what's law? what's what, philosopher? What's what's natural law? Tell me. Uh, it's just inherent within us. It's based on rationality and we it's, it's ours. It's not conferred by any one ex, any organization or government. Or, it's just inherent to the human condition. Inherent. What does inherent mean? Locke would say it was bestowed upon us, I think, by our creator. Ooh, where have you seen this language for? Rights from creator. Where have we seen this before? You're on the right track. From religion. And the, uh, the, the, turn to page nine. The declaration of the What does it say? Page nine. Second paragraph. Go ahead and go for it. Read it. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Look at that, huh? Mm -hmm. Eddie's saying inherent. Kelsey said assumed. Jefferson said self-evident. Right? From the very beginning of our Constitution, we had this notion that there were certain rights. These rights are from our Creator. God, day, whoever that is, we have these rights. Maybe they come from the English Bill of Rights or common law rights. Maybe they're from God. Maybe they're from who knows where. But we have this body of rights. And these rights are unalienable, meaning they cannot be infringed. And what are these? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the framers of the Constitution viewed liberty in a very different way that's often assumed today. People often say that, you know, we have these rights from the government, right? If you go read any Constitution from Europe, There'll be hundreds of pages long saying so you have the right to health care, you have the right to you know, health insurance, you have the right to food, you have the right to clothing, you have the right to education. All these what we might call positive rights. The government has to give you stuff. Um, our Constitution just uh, defines rights negatively. Government can't do this to you. You can do stuff on your own. And this was fairly unique in the world at the time and especially today. So let's go back to the Ninth Amendment, right? The enumeration of the Constitution of Certain Rights. BOR is Bill of Rights, in case you didn't figure that out, right? So just because certain rights are mentioned in the Bill of Rights, that should not be construed to disparage other rights retained by the people. This is a rule of construction. So you study in contracts expressio unius, right? So if I list in the agreement, you have the free speech, you have freedom of the press, you have freedom of religion, and freedom of, uh, you know, guns, whatever, right? Some come and say, well, you have these five rights, that's all you have, you're done. You have no other rights. You only have the rights listed. So in order to avoid that presumption, James Madison, who was instrumental in writing the Ninth Amendment, said, wait a minute, guys, you have far more rights than those listed in, in this, you know, little document. Just because we aren't listing something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The rights retained by the people, that the people as inherent, self inalienable, whatever word you want to use, by virtue of, uh, by virtue of birth they have these rights. And the government cannot infringe those. So I wouldn't get that general gist. Okay, the general issue is fine. Now, ladies, let me ask you this question. What are the rights retained by the people? What are the scope of these rights? Define them. What are they? Give me examples. What we are capable of doing. Where you Give me an example. Freedom. Okay. What about abortion? Oh, could the state <laughs> infringe on abortion? Can the state ban abortion? Some people say yes, some people say no. Is that a natural right? Sodomy. Could the state ban sodomy? Saying it's immoral. So the, can the state criminalize drugs? Well, if you do drugs, you run the risk of hurting somebody else. So yes. Prostitution. 
assisted suicide. What if someone's very ill and you want to help them commit suicide? Could the state criminalize it? You go. I think your hand was up. So the problem, which is not hey, Jason. Yes. No, it's okay. Go ahead. So the problem with the Ninth Amendment, and I'm not saying this is necessarily correct, is that judges often say, we don't know what these rights are. At least in the Bill of Rights, they're listed. We can say, okay, so you have speech, you have religion, but you don't know what the rights are. So Robert Bork, who was famously appointed to the Supreme Court and then he never made it through because he was blocked by Ted Kennedy, among others, said about the Ninth Amendment, it's like an ink blot. As if the framers were writing at the amendment and they spilled some ink on the Ninth Amendment, and I don't know what's underneath that ink blot. How can I, as a judge, invalidate laws of a state based on an ink blot? That's what Robert Bork says. The flip side to that is that we are not working from a blank slate or blank spaces, as Taylor would say, right? We have history. We have a history of a natural rights tradition in this country, the word Eddie used. And there were various conceptions of what these rights are. Rights to property, rights to earn an honest living, the right to sue and be sued. There were certain rights which were generally understood, right? But does that give court state licenses to invalidate laws? So the long and short of it is the Ninth Amendment is effectively a dead letter in the Supreme Court. Uh, no court, to my knowledge, I don't think, has ever actually used it to invalidate the law. It's been decided this is only a rule of construction. It doesn't really mean anything. The closest you got was in the case of Griswold versus Connecticut. This was a contraceptive case. Justice Arthur Goldberg wrote a concurring opinion saying, well, you know, you have all these things about privacy, and you know, the Ninth Amendment supports contraceptives, but because the Ninth Amendment only applies to the federal government, and this was a Connecticut state law, it doesn't really apply. That's the closest you get. So we have the Ninth Amendment has been effectively read out of the Constitution, because people are afraid that once you allow unenumerated rights to kick in, it'll be crazy. Yet, we have the Due Process Clause. Substantive due process. Where courts have read into the due process clause everything from abortion to contraception to sodomy to maybe gay marriage. Who knows? Right? So judges haven't been afraid of unenumerated rights. They've only picked the ones they liked. And the ones they've rejected are those most consistent with the natural law tradition of our country. Right? The ones with the strongest claim to historical backing, like the right to earn a living, the right to property, those have been shooed away by the Lochner era. Oh, phew, property, fluff, we don't need that. But rights which are fairly modern, like you know, abortion, those are fundamental because footnote four said so. And herein lies the internal contradiction of constitutional law. <laughs> there is a tradition of preservation of certain unenumerated rights, but those have been ignored. But modern rights, which are no, no to be found in our constitutional tradition, are basically treated as sacrosanct because of footnote four. Okay. <sighs> All right. Questions. Anything? We elaborate on what you just said. You so spit it out so quickly. Oh, shall I'll repeat it. So, footnote four of Caroline Products, right? It split up rights. It said rights in the Bill of Rights are important, so we'll protect them. Rights that are outside the Bill of Rights are not important unless we call them fundamental. What makes the right fundamental? It's important to the judges. And if a right's important to a judge, then it gets some sort of strict scrutiny. So what footnote four did was it repudiated much of the natural law tradition. It said, oh, these rights of property, the right to earn a living, economic liberty, Feth, Lochner. Abortion, though, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta prepare for that, though. Contraceptives. And they effectively inverted our pyramid of rights to take some things which were contemporary and put them at the top. And they took other rights which were very important for a long period of time and kicked them to the curb. And this was the legacy of footnote four, which uh, did perhaps more than anything else to kill uh, the common understanding of, uh, of rights. Okay, any questions? No? 
I will see you all next week. Have a great day. We, have we don't have class next week. I'll see you the week after. Thank you, Dad. No class next week. I just had a question regarding the meeting that you um